there if you would. Just a reminder, we're going to be spending uh, four weeks. This is the second of four weeks on this series we're calling Believe. We're going to, when that's over, we're going to move into a series that Bruce told you about, Follow Me. So we're going to believe, then we're going to follow. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, it's my passion. My, my desire is that everybody sitting in this room uh, would be part of a small group as we go through Follow Me. One of the stories that I hear almost every Sunday is, I've just started coming to Trinity in the last four or five months, you know, whatever. Love the worship, love being here, and so I'll follow up. Well, well have, have you gotten a small group yet? And the answer is usually, well, not yet. Well, this is a six-week time to jump into a small group. Like Bruce said, we're going to have some here on Sunday evening. There's going to be some meeting throughout the week. It's going to be a great time. So my encouragement, get the book, uh, start digging in. Let's, let's grow through this together. It's going to be a challenging time uh, as, as we move into the Follow Me series. I've got to give one little shout out, and then we'll get into the Word. We have a group here from New Mexico, right? Where, where are the... I see some of you. All right, welcome. Welcome. This group, let, let me make sure I get this right. They're on a mission trip, and they're going to be leaving, is it tomorrow, uh, to go down to uh, Mexico to, to build a loft house for a family down there in Ensenada. And they're here to worship with us this morning. And I will say, uh, Scott and Joy Reynolds uh, were part of our college ministry, so I love having them back in town. And uh, they're kind of steerheading uh, this group, so welcome. And I'll do my best to keep you awake for the next half hour or so, all right? So, John chapter 6. Uh, let's start reading together at verse 25. We'll read the passage, and then we'll pray together and dig into it. John 6, 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent, whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives light to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these rich promises from Scripture. That you would send your Son to reveal yourself, and that your Son would not only live a life of sinless perfection, accurately revealing the glory of the Father, but that he would go on through his humility and obedience to die on the cross and then to conquer death in the grave, not merely as our example, but as our substitute. Father, as we take a look this morning at what it means to do the work that you require, which is to believe in the one whom you have sent, that you would open the eyes of our hearts and our minds that we would be receptive to your word. Father, we commit this time to you. We ask that you receive the glory and that you work in people's lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the basic structure of this passage is that there are three questions that Jesus has asked. And as we look at these questions and his answers, we're going to learn quite a bit about who Jesus is and learn about what we are called to do as we pursue him and, and, and walk in obedience to him. And really what it boils down to is what it means to believe uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just jump into this. The first question they ask is in verse 25. They asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And he answered them, Truly I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now let me just kind of back up to give this some context. John chapter 6, when it begins, Jesus is performing his most popular miracle ever. And that's the feeding of the 5,000. It's his most popular because it involved the most people. And it's the most popular because it involved, let's face it, free food, right? Everybody likes that. No one's going to walk away saying, what a terrible guy to give everyone free food. 
As a matter of fact, it goes deeper than that because when you read this passage and get to verse 14, you begin to understand they got it. In verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. They're starting to believe. For anyone to do a sign such as this must be from God. Now Jesus had this way of pushing people away. So it's like as soon as everyone got excited about Jesus, he would have a way of just pushing them away. And this is what he does next. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. We read that Jesus told the multitudes to, to go home. He told the disciples literally to go jump in a lake, <laughs> to, 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 to get in their ship and to, to go to the other side of the sea. And Jesus goes up to the mountain by himself to pray. Well, if you keep reading through John chapter 6, as the disciples are making their way across the sea many hours later, this storm arises. Sometimes I jokingly say that Jesus prayed up a storm. I know that was bad, but I thought I'd do it anyway. But, but Jesus, as he's praying, this storm rolls in, and then Jesus comes to the disciples walking on the water. He's welcomed into the boat. The boat's immediately on the other side of the water. They find themselves in Capernaum. And we, as we know from verse 59 of chapter 6, what we're reading now, uh, this conversation takes place in the synagogue. So here's Jesus in Capernaum, in the synagogue. Meanwhile, if you backtrack to these crowds who ate the fish and the loaves, they're now looking for Jesus. Where is he? We know the disciples left in the boat. We don't see Jesus. Finally, they just go to Capernaum, and they find the disciples, and there's Jesus as well. So they come to him and say, it's an honest question. How did you get here? And Jesus, instead of saying, hey, I walked on the water. You know, instead of doing that, he begins to challenge their pursuit. You are pursuing me, but not because you saw this great sign that makes you understand that I am the Christ, the Son of God. You are pursuing me because I gave you food, and you want more. Guys, don't pursue the food. Don't work for the food that will spoil or perish. But instead, seek after that. Work for that. That food which endures to eternal life. And if you fast forward to today, we see that, don't we? Don't we so many times we pursue the things that just fade away? We pursue things like health and prosperity Comfort, fame, status, prestige. These are the things that, that we so often pursue. Problem is, they're all temporary. They're not bad, they're just temporary. And the, the, what Jesus is calling us to is don't settle, don't limit your pursuit to those things which fade away, but pursue that which lasts eternally. And he goes on to say in here, that this is the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man gives to you. This food is available through Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, for on him God the Father has set his seal. That's a, that's a confusing passage, but basically it's saying that, that God has put his stamp of approval. Some people point back to the baptism when you, know, the, you, you hear the voice of God, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The seal of God is on Jesus. And, the, and this Life that endures, is food that endures to eternal life is available through the Son. And I think so many times what we're guilty of, or what some people are guilty of, is we also want to take Jesus by force. You see, the, we read in, in verse 15, they wanted to take him by force and make him king. They did not like the idea of a Messiah who was going to be a suffering servant to die on the cross in their place. What they wanted was a victorious conquering Messiah that was going to overthrow the Roman oppression. So they wanted to take him by force and make him into what he wanted, they wanted him to be. And in the same way, for our benefit, Jesus shed his blood on the cross so that we can be forgiven, so that we can have peace with God, so that we can have eternal life, all these rich blessings so that we can be seated with him in heavenly places. All of this is ours in Christ. But so many times we're not content. That's not the Messiah that some people want. And so we want to take him by force and make him into the Messiah that's going to make us comfortable and wealthy and happy and all of these things instead of being focused on who Jesus is and walking with him as he leads us as part of the kingdom of God. 
This is why Jesus would say, don't worry about these things that fade away. In, in Matthew 6, he literally says that as part of the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after all these things. And you know what? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But what is he saying? Said, Seek first what? The kingdom of God and, and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So what's he saying? Pursue that. Pursue the kingdom of God. So he's looking at, at these people who have crossed the sea pursuing. He's saying, you know, you, don't come because you want more food. It's just going to fade away. You need to work for, labor for, pursue the food that will endure to eternal life, which is only found through Jesus. So that brings them to their second question, which is one not just a pursuit, but one of purpose. Their question is in verse 28. So they said, what must we do to do the works of God? You see, Jesus was trying to get them to see. It, it, it's not about the temporary, it's about the eternal. So pursue that. But they heard one word, work. Jesus said, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And they heard work. Okay, well, what is this work? And isn't that the question that most religions try to answer? This is the idea, right? That if you work and if you do these things, you will appease God or maybe even please God. But it's a result of these works. And, and I almost see, especially from, from, from this context, I almost get this pride. This pride of saying, okay, Jesus, tell me what these works are. And, and the, the way to best understand this, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What, what, what it's saying here, what must we do so that we are doing the work that God requires? What's the work that God requires of us to have this eternal life? Because here's where the pride comes in, because whatever you say, we can do it. You, do you hear that pride? Because we already fast, we already read scripture, we already pray, we honor the Sabbath, we honor our parents, we have this long list of things that we're doing, so tell us, what works do we need to add to this? And Jesus said, okay, here's the work. Here's the work that God wants you to do. Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then there's a period. That's it? You mean we can stop fasting? What, what, what do you mean by this? The, here's what God requires. That you believe in Christ. But Jesus, we ask about works. What are the works we can do? Well, this is the work. Believe. Period. Hmm. You see, in the, in the New Testament... Well, in, in English language as well, believe is, is very much related to the word faith. Now, if you look at it in the Greek, it's amazingly similar. It's the same root word. And throughout the New Testament, what we see is that it's not as a result of our works, our ability to keep the law, to do good, by which we are justified before God. But it's by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And so they're saying, what are the works that God requires and Jesus is saying the only work is that you believe. Turn with me if you would. Keep your finger there in John chapter 6. A couple of books to the right. The book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 21. Paul says this very clearly. Same thing Jesus is saying. In John chapter 6, he says, Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So the righteousness of God comes not by obedience to the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Paul is just kind of developing a little further what Jesus said, that it is not by your works. The works that God requires is that you have faith and that you believe. And it's not through obedience to the law. It's not through right living, moral living, doing all the right things that you find 
peace with God, that you are justified before God. The justification comes by his grace as a gift. And we receive this gift as we believe through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is what God is calling us to. Now, if you go back to John chapter 6, you would think that these people who are so bound up in doing all the right works would hear this message from Jesus and say, that sounds so easy. Sign me up. I can believe. And you'd think by the time you got to the end of John chapter 6 that this whole group would be following Jesus. But the problem is, if you know John chapter 6... It ends with almost everybody except for 12 men leaving, saying this is too hard. Because Jesus, early in the chapter, as we just read, said this is the work of God that you believe. You read later in the chapter, what does this belief look like? Well, part of it means that you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which caused them to say that's not the kind of belief I was wanting to hear. And that the same Jesus who said, this is the work of God that you believe, would also go on to say that to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The same Jesus who said, this is the work of God, just that you believe, would, would say, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. Let the dead bury their dead, he would say. The same Jesus who said, just believe, would say, you need to love me so much that in comparison to that love, you would hate your, your parents and your siblings and your spouse and your children and even yourself, or you're not worthy to be my disciple. And I want you to understand, when he says, just believe, I, I, I think it should cause us to wrestle with what does it mean to believe. And I, Hang with me here, because what I don't want to do, I think what so many people do is they keep wanting to add works to just believe. The Bible is clear that it's not through our works but it's through a faith, through believing in Jesus. But if it's, a, if it's an authentic, sincere, deep, central belief in Jesus, it's going to transform our lives. So let me work through this with you. I was reading a book, actually I read it a few years ago, by J.P. Moreland. It was written back in the late 90s. Uh, it's called Love Your God With All Your Mind. And through that, he started talking about what it means to believe. And he said there's really three different aspects of belief that you need to process and think through. The first of which is that, that you need to look at the content of the belief. The content of, of this belief. That, that his point is basically, we believe things because they're true. Can I, let, let, let's just do this. How many of you still have somewhere in your house a box of like video cassette tapes? Maybe some movies? Okay. Do you even have a VCR? Okay, because I get the feeling some of us are like a, a, a garage sale away from total freedom in this area. Um, we still have a VCR, but I'll be honest with you, it's one of those, you know, those little 13 inch TVs with the combo VCR. So we still have all these video cassette tapes that if you want to watch it, you have to crowd around this tiny TV and, and watch this old movie. Well, let's suppose you're going through your, your box of old video cassettes and you run across another treasure from the late nineties, uh, this priceless gem called Space Jam. Okay. <laughs> Are you with me there? Does a movie get any better than Michael Jordan playing basketball with Looney Tunes characters in outer space? I, it, it just doesn't get any better than that, right? And so let's suppose you're reminiscing. I want to watch Space Jam again. You pop that baby into your VCR, and then you start hearing this song. Do you remember the song from Space Jam? It's a great one. It's R. Kelly, and he steps up and says, I believe I can fly, right? <laughs> and so you listen to that enough and decide, hey, I believe I can fly. <laughs> so you pull out your ladder. <laughs> you climb up on the roof of your house. All of your neighbors are wondering what's going on, and you just break out into song. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I've been thinking about this I don't know, every night and day. No, I'll stop. Okay, so, so you get up there, and here's my point. I don't care how sincerely you believe that you can fly. You can't. And please don't act on that belief. It's not going to end well for you. And my point about belief is 
We tend to think today, and we're actually taught in some places, that things are so because we believe them to be so. That if you believe strongly enough, then it's okay. What we need to understand is that things aren't true because we believe them. We believe things because they are true. And this is what I mean by the content of belief. You don't just make something up and believe it. Now, what are we called? What's the content that we're called to believe in John's gospel? Remember last week we looked at John chapter 20. And he said, I have written these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. So we're called to believe what? About the person of Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. That we believe in that he is part of the Godhead. But also, what are the things that were written? The things that were written were, he said, I didn't include all the signs that he did, all the miracles he did, but these signs I have included so that you might believe. So not only are we believing in the person of Christ, but he's saying let's look at the works of Christ, which ultimately lead up to the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And we see that the work of Christ... That as his person, fully God, fully man, that's who he is. The work was the work he accomplished on the cross, paying the price for our salvation so that we can stand forgiven before God. He's saying, this is the content. Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that what he accomplished on the cross is enough for your salvation? That's the content of what we believe. But there's another element of belief, and this is that beliefs vary in their strength. That we believe some things more strongly than we believe other things. I believe that it might rain this week. I also know I live in Southern California, and I'm not going to believe that very strongly. I also believe that when I drive out of the parking lot and pull on the freeway, I'm not going to be the only car on the freeway. I believe that one really strongly. I've never been the only car on the freeway, right? So there are some things we believe more strongly than others. I can say I believe that this stool is going to support my weight. And I can talk about how much I believe that. But do you know what it means to believe it strongly? It means that I'm going to walk over to this. Bill, is it okay? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure before I sit on it. This is when I believe, right? When I sit confidently... Because I really believe that this stool can carry my weight. And I think, I think there are a lot of people today that we have kind of a half-hearted belief in Jesus, but not really believing in him enough to trust him. Let, let me get into one more. The, the other area that Moreland points out in his book is the beliefs are based on content. Then we look at the strength of beliefs. And the other one, a few beliefs become central. The centrality of beliefs are important. There are some things I believe strongly, very strongly but they're not really central in my life. For example, I believe that grass is green. Now, some of you may argue, well, my grass is brown. You know, healthy grass is green. And I believe that so strongly. But let's suppose one day we wake up and we find out we've been wrong. Let's, you wake up and all the grass is a diff different color. Let's say it's a beautiful shade of Dodger blue. Don't anticipate what I'm going to say. <laughs> And if I wake up and all the grass is this, this beautiful shade of Dodger blue, I, I'm going to be shocked. I'm going to be thinking, how did that happen? But you know what I'm going to do shortly after that? I'm going to get in my car and drive off and go to work. Because, hmm, I was wrong. I thought grass was green. Turns out it's blue. It doesn't really affect who I am. But if somewhere along the line, I find out that what I've read in the Word is not true, if I find out that God does not exist as a triune being, if I find out that salvation is not a gift from God's grace that I receive as a result of, of faith and believing in Jesus, if I find out that the virgin birth is not true, that the resurrection did not happen, if I find out that people are not alienated from God by their sin and desperately need to believe in Jesus Christ, suddenly everything, my whole grid has has just changed. I mean, at this point, I'm shaken. 
Because believing in Jesus is not just something that I add to a list of other things I believe. It is the central belief in my life. And suddenly everything else flows out of this belief. At the core of who I am, it's someone who believes in Jesus. And this belief informs who I marry. It informs what I do with my free time. It informs what I study, what I do with my life. It informs why I spend time going to Mexico to build a house for a needy family. I mean, you can go on and on. This belief shapes everything that there is about me. So, so with that in mind, let's come back to what Jesus is saying. He's saying this is the work of God that you believe. But we begin to understand it's not I have to do all of these works of obeying the law so that I can be accepted by God. It's saying what I have to do is believe in Jesus. But when that belief in Jesus is, is based on truth, it is a strong belief. But not only that, it is the central belief in my life. Suddenly it begins to make sense of saying I'm going to deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus because he's all that matters. And it's the most important thing in my life. And as painful as it is to say that because of that, because of this belief, I'm going to love Jesus even more than I love my wife and my kids and even myself, it makes sense when Jesus becomes the core truth in my life. And suddenly all these crazy things that we do make sense when you understand that belief is, that does not mean, you know, like, oh my goodness, how did this come to mind? I, growing up, Mary Martin, Peter Pan, back in 1960, any of you go back that far. I was not alive in 1960, I'll say that, but we did watch that Peter Pan in elementary school, and it was terrible, but we watched it, and do you remember that scene where she's like, do you believe in fairies? Okay, none of you remember that. I feel so stupid. Do any of you remember that? Please give me some love here. This wasn't in the notes. Okay, okay. I promise you this is not in my notes. It will not come up third service, but... <laughs> I remember as a kid, just like, yes, I believe in fairies. Come on, Tinkerbell, come back to life. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is this belief that I'm not just going to clap along and hope Tinkerbell comes back, but it's saying I'm going to give my life for this because it defines me. It's the central truth of who I am. Let's move to the, the third question because this is where really we move from signs to the Savior. So they say, okay, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? I got to be honest, that kind of cracks me up. I think Jesus at this point is saying, really? You're the people that ate the bread and the fish, right? And you know that somehow I got here without a boat. And now you're asking me for a sign to prove that I'm from God? What, what more do you need? They go on to say, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. At this point, they're saying, okay, you know, that was kind of impressive what you did yesterday. Let me tell you about Moses, though. Six days a week for almost 40 years. That's how, many, that's how often he fed the people with bread. Now, I know you want us to be impressed by feeding 5,000 once, but look what Moses did. Now, once again, if we're honest today, don't you still hear this? If only God would give me a sign. If only like I'd come to my mailbox and there's this envelope of cash <laughs> where mysteriously appears and I say, this must be from God, I believe. And you hear crazy stuff. I look up in the sky and see this cloud shaped like a cross and then I knew that God was real. Or I got a grilled cheese sandwich and it looks like the face of Jesus <laughs> right there. And I'm thinking, God has given us his word. His son has risen from the dead. We have evidence all over the place for the existence of God. Turn to the word. Don't look for him in your grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, he told the story. Do you remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? And at the end of the story, you've got Lazarus in Abraham's bosom in paradise. You've got the rich man in a place of torments. And he says, well, could you, could you send Lazarus? Because I have five brothers that don't believe. And if, if Lazarus comes back from the dead, surely 
they will believe. And do you remember how that story ends? Jesus says, you know what? Even if someone comes back from the dead, they will not believe. If they have not believed Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even if someone rises from the dead. He's speaking prophetically. I'm going to rise from the dead and people are still not going to believe. We have all the signs we need today that's found in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the point of this passage. To move beyond looking for a signs to come to the Savior. He goes on to say, in, in response to Moses giving the manna in the wilderness, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread. Notice that's past tense from heaven. But my Father gives, present tense, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. He said, this is not Moses that did this. God did this. But look what he's doing now. He's giving you the true bread now that's found not in a sign, not in a work, but it's found in, in a person in Jesus Christ. And what do we read about Jesus? We say that he comes down from heaven. Well, we've earlier read he's been sent by the Father. And now we read that he comes down from heaven. This is just pointing back to his deity. That one who comes down from heaven... It means that he was there. He was there as the second person of the Godhead. That he is the fullness of God in bodily form. And he came down from heaven and does what? Gives life to the world. That salvation, forgiveness is found not in a sign, not in a work. It's found in Jesus Christ. If you skip down to verse 40, what does he say? That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Not only is it salvation and forgiveness, but he's offering eternal life. And then he goes on to say, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what do we find in Jesus? We find who he is, that he came down from heaven. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus is God, came down from heaven, gives life to the world through forgiveness and salvation. He offers eternal life to those who believe and the future hope of the resurrection that on the last day he will raise them up. And then Jesus says very clearly, because the key verse is verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus said, I am the bread. Now come on, Bible scholars, here we go again. Last week we saw there were seven signs in John's gospel and we named them all. There's also seven times Jesus says, I am something. Now, the one we're not including is when Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, okay? But there's seven times when he says, I am something. We know one is, I am the bread of life. What else have we got? We got name seven. I am the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, the door, the good shepherd. Did I hear the way, the truth, the life? I think we're missing one. It's not the living water. The vine, the true vine. Very good. So those are the seven, seven that are in John's gospel. Very good. But notice what he says. He says, I am the bread of life. This is all pointing back to who Jesus is. Notice the, the responses. That, he says, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me will not thirst. What does it mean to come to Jesus? It basically means this, that you're doing something and then you stop and you turn and you come to Jesus. There's a biblical phrase for turning and coming. Do you know what it is? Repent. He says, whoever stops, turns around and comes to me will never be hungry. Why would you stop and turn around and come to Jesus? It's answered in the next part of the verse, because you believe that you have found him based on the content, the strength of the belief, the centrality of the belief, that you turn and come to Jesus because you found him to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by him. And it's through believing. And notice that Jesus satisfies. Never hunger, never thirst, as you come and as you believe. Is this not the, the key verse of John's gospel, the most famous verse in John's gospel. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him 
will not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, that's a good job because that's like three different versions just mashed into one, but you hung with me there. But isn't that it? God loved the world, gave his son, and whoever believes. Let me just close by showing you how this chapter ends. We get down to verse 66. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And that this is the point. That when you come to the point of saying we believe, then really nothing else matters. Where else are we going to go? Listen, the Christian life is not easy. We go through difficult times. We go through painful times. But where else can we go? Because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of you this morning may have not yet placed your faith in Jesus. And, and notice the simplicity of this message, that you don't have to work to be better. You don't have to try to fix yourself up. You just... You believe, but it's a belief that becomes the core of your life. You know, there's a song that we're singing over this series that just says, we believe in God the Father. It's just a proclamation of our belief in who God is. And I pray that as we sing that this morning, that we can just declare it because we've thought through what it means to say, we believe. Let's pray together. And just before we pray, let me just mention for those of you that maybe haven't given your lives to the Lord or haven't placed your faith in Him, there will be some elders and some others available uh, up here afterwards if you'd like to speak with someone uh, about how you can have a relationship with the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the person of Christ and the work of Christ on our behalf so that we can be forgiven and have a relationship with You and have eternal life. So Father God, take the word that has been shared today. Would you allow it to take root in our hearts and lives and transform us into people that are pleasing to you? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.